Hi, Katera. Happy New Year. Thank you. Even though it's the 22nd, we're still saying <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> I, <know>. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll Brown, give everybody Brown, just, a, yeah. just a few okay. more minutes to get on. We'll start in about maybe three or four minutes. Okay. <laughs> For those of you who are on, if you would please remember to mute your phones and your computers, please, to minimize distractions. Oh my gosh, look at that sweet girl. How's she doing? She's very healthy and likes to complain a lot. Okay, everyone, good afternoon. It appears as if it is two o'clock on the dot. I wanna welcome you all back for this meeting of the Louisiana COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. I'm Katera Williams, I'm the Chief of Staff at Southern and uh, glad to see your faces. Hope you all had a uh, wonderful new year. Of course, I know with everything going on, uh, the relaxation time has certainly been minimal for most of us on the phone, however, we will keep pressing forward um, as we tackle this pandemic for our state. Um, before we dive into today's um, agenda, we will go on and do our roll call. Ms. Gerald, are you there? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Good afternoon, happy new year to everyone. Dr. Sandra Brown. Here. Dr. Thomas Lavis. President. Dr. Katara Williams. I am here. Secretary Kimberly Lewis Robinson. Dr. Victor Jones. Here. Dr. Adrian Wilson. Dr. Mary Meg Brown. Dr. Renato Banks. Senator Regina Barrow. Here. Dr. Terry 
Davis? Or missing B and C. Is that the only people? Right, Dr. Rebecca. Terry Davis is here. Sorry, I was slow on the unmute. That's okay. I have you, Dr. Davis. Dr. Rebecca G. Jesus. Miss Tiffany Letters. Oh, no. I lost it. I can ask everyone to put their phones on mute, please. Me? Carol Smith. Dr. Ronnie Whitfield. Present. Dr. Gary Wilkes. I'm here. Dr. Mm -hmm. Gary. Dr. Mm -hmm. Eric Van Home. Dr. Delesso Alford. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tavel Tavel Tindall. I'm here. Representative yeah. Justin Miller. Ms. Alma Stewart. Mr. Christopher Tyson. Means. Dr. Right. Rick Rivares. Here. Dr. Corey Abair. Ms. Lenore Carroll. Here. Dr. Keith Vernon. Councilwoman Helena Marino. Sadie Finkel is here in her place. I, thank you, Ms. Finkel. Councilwoman Cindy Wynn. Dr. Alicia Bates. Dr. Janine Thomas. Here. Dr. Leanne Fowler. Ms. Cindy Snyder. Present. Ms. Kathleen Tate. Present. Dr. Lisa Van Hoos. Ms. Shalina Davis. Mr. Michael McClellan. No, 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 no. Dr. Connie Arnold. Here, I'm here. Dr. Faye Grimsley. Ms. Erica Rogers. Mr. Frederick Thomas. Present. Dr. Demetrius Porsche. Ms. Judy Le Reese Morse. Dr. Earl Benjamin Robinson. Dr. Peter Foss. Dr. Kathleen Kennedy. Here. Dr. Robert Maupin. Present. Dr. Christy Anderson. Present. Dr. Takesha Davis. Present. Dr. Amanda Dumas. I'm here. Dr. Amy Lesson. I'm present. Dr. Ebony Price Haywood. Dr. Margarita Escheviri. Ms. Christian Engel. Ms. Tina Granger. Ms. Catherine Haywood. Here. Okay, thank you. Reverend Theron Jackson. Mr. Rudy Macklin. Dr. Orlando McMeans. Present. Dr. Rhoda Reddix. Present. Dr. Simone Rambati. Dr. Jacqueline Harris. Dr. Peter. Here. Okay, thank you. Dr. Peter Kasmarski. I'm here. Dr. S Daniel Sarpong. Present. Okay. If you came on after the um, your name was called, if you please put your name in the chat, I'll mark you present. That concludes the roll call, Dr. Williams. Thank you, Ms. Gerald. Before we begin, uh, just a reminder for all of you again to please mute your phones uh, when you are not speaking. 
Um, also, if you have any public comments, uh, we do have staff standing by. Uh, you can email those public comments to public underscore comments at sus.edu, um, or you can always click log onto our website and click on the link to log your public comments. Uh, before we turn it over to the co-chairs, I just wanted to take a moment um, to acknowledge um, several superstars that we have on the, on the call with us today. Um, they just finished an excellent conversation uh, on the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, lots of great questions were um, submitted on the spot from community members. And uh, so we, it was a great opportunity for us to listen to some of the concerns firsthand in real time in terms of the uh, apprehension that many of our communities have relative to the COVID-19 uh, vaccination. And as I quote Dr. Davis, it was a really good opportunity to spread facts and not fear. I love that. And so I just wanna uh, shout out for a minute, Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Sizer, Dr. Sterling, Dr. Davis, Dr. Griggs, Dr. Ricks, and Dr. Abair for an excellent webinar uh, that just concluded earlier today. So um, hats off, let's keep spreading uh, facts, not fear, and quoting Dr. Davis. And uh, thank you all for what you do um, as members of this task force. So with that, we're gonna dive into today's agenda. We have a pretty lengthy one and uh, I will turn it over to the co-chairs to bring greetings, Dr. Leviste and Dr. Brown. Okay, well, good afternoon. And um, let me add my thanks again to those of you who did the, did the program earlier today. And also my thanks to everyone on this task force for all the work that we're doing to uh, help the state manage through this crisis. Um, I think we should, uh, it's fitting that we acknowledge that we have moved into a new phase in many different ways. A new phase in that we are now, we now have a vaccine and we're now struggling with the issue of ensuring that it can be will be deployed in an equitable fashion, but also a new phase in that we now have a partner in the federal government. Um, the federal government will, is now promising to play its traditional role of coordination and support in managing this pandemic. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to start ramping up the production of the vaccine much more quickly now, and that will be more effective in getting the vaccine to where it needs to be and getting through this pandemic. So I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Dr. Brown, um, who will move us through the agenda. Hello and welcome everyone and, and a happy new year. Uh, 2020 was certainly the year that changed the world, uh, but we're optimistic that 2021 will be the year that heals the world. Uh, there is a renewed spirit of hope, healing, and unity in our country today. As a task force, we are nine months into our work. COVID is not over and our work is not done. In the governor's press conference today, he referenced the Health Equity Task Force and reaffirmed our charge as it relates to health equity and the vaccine. So the task force will be engaged with LDH to ensure that the citizens of Louisiana receive accurate information from trusted sources and that the vaccine is made available to all citizens fairly and equitably. I also joined Dr. Williams in congratulating Dr. Benjamin in leading such an inviting and engaging and informative webinar today and the task force members who participated. Well done, well done. At this time, we'll dive right into our agenda. Uh, first on the agenda is uh, an update on the Louisiana COVID-19 vaccine. We have um, two distinguished representatives to provide us real-time data. Dr. Joseph Cantor, Interim Assistant Secretary, Office of the Public Health, and Dr. Courtney Phillips, Secretary of the Louisiana Department of Health. We'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Brown, and thank you, Dr. Levis. Um, and Dr. Williams, I have to echo your thoughts um, in terms of Dr. Benjamin and all the panelists that participated in the, um, the conversation today. That is recorded, and we want to make sure we're able to push that out. They did a phenomenal job. We got lots of wonderful feedback. I think those are needed conversations in our community where folks can, can feel like they're getting the trusted information um, and have a source of where to get that from. And so I think the more and more that we can push that out, it's going to be helpful for, for our communities. Um, I did talk with Dr. Brown and Dr. Levise earlier this week and want to make sure that as you all are having 
your ongoing uh, meetings in terms of the Health Equity Task Force that we make sure we get a, a standing agenda item to, to be able to provide updated information in terms of where we are with the vaccine. What does it look like with the rollout? Um, what are we hearing from our federal partners? What are we hearing from our partners within the state? And then what are you all hearing um, throughout your respective areas that we can factor in as we're doing some of our planning process? We do know that we're gonna need your help in terms of the partnerships and not just communication, but understanding our data, understanding where there are gaps and where we can fill in that information. As Dr. Brown mentioned, um, the governor did reference the Health Equity Task Force today. Um, and we did roll out some of our very initial demographic data. Um, and I, I do say very initial because this was the same process we took on when we did some of the, just the COVID case data. Um, and it improved over time, week by week, we continue to add different factors to it. Uh, but we see the data right now um, when we look at the race data, and Dr. Cantor will get into this in his presentation, but I think we have some opportunities that we can um, partner with you all to try to dig deeper in terms of the demographic data that we see in terms of who's receiving the vaccine, uh, the category of other unknown is pretty high, but also what does it look like in terms of the demographic data for the current eligibility groups? That's a piece that we definitely could probably use some assistance on from the Health Equity Task Force. Again, the communication piece will be a big one of what you all are hearing on the ground. Thank you for the, the work that you're doing with LPHI to fund some of those surveys to get information in terms of vaccine hesitancy and how do we reach people. And so I think those continued partnerships will be helpful, but I do wanna make sure that um, week by week or every other week when you're meeting, we make sure that we're providing you all with ongoing information and that you all share what you're receiving as well. So we, again, we can factor that into the conversation and the planning piece. So with that, I'll make sure I just turn it over to, to Dr. Cantor for the overview. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Thank you, Dr. Brown and to everyone else who joined. Uh, let me echo Dr. Phillips in thanking uh, everyone who was involved in the session that, that occurred earlier today, certainly Dr. Benjamin and everyone else on, on the line that participated in that. I wasn't able to, to, to be on it, but I've, I've heard feedback from a number of folks right now that it was um, very successful. So um, to everyone who helped and, and certainly um, Shalina to your team at LPHI for supporting in that, uh, we really, really do thank you uh, for all of that. And um, I also wanted to note, um, uh, to, to, to echo of uh, Dr. Lavisa's comments, um, I, I do know there are folks on this line who um, assisted the Biden team in, in providing some insight in, in, in how to stand up their COVID Health Equity Task Force. Um, so I, I wanna thank you for, for helping with that. Um, we, we were one of, the, one of the earlier states to do that. So thanks for folks that were able to, to step into that. Um, I'll give a quick update for, for vaccine issues and, and then kind of leave some time for questions. We continue um, to primarily be limited by supply. And uh, it, it's encouraging to have far more um, need or demand than we have vaccine available, but it certainly is, is frustrating at the same time. We, we have a network of about 1,800 community vaccinating partners. These are mostly clinics and pharmacies and hospitals who are enrolled and ready to receive and, and eager to receive vaccine, which is actually much more than other states. We've invested a lot of time and energy in standing up a very broad network um, as opposed to doing um, mass events, so to say, because we think it's gonna help us down the road. Um, so we have a lot of people saying they're ready to give vaccine. We have a lot of people saying they're ready to receive vaccine and, and we're really limited by the amount that we're getting from Operation Warp Speed. The allocations we've gotten have been almost exactly flat um, going back three or four, even five weeks. Um, so this past week, we got just over 58,000 doses divided almost equally between Pfizer and Moderna. It's the exact same amount that we'll be getting next week. And what Operation Warp Speed has told us, what General Perna has told us, who uh, looks like we'll be staying on with the new administration, is to expect about that amount for about four or five more weeks before supply picks up. So it's not where we hope to be. We hope to have more vaccine by this point in time, but we just don't. Uh, the other thing that's been somewhat of a handicap for all states, certainly us included, is the predictability issue and, and, and we still do not get notice of how much vaccine we will receive in a given week until just a few days prior to it being sent to us. And um, doesn't leave us a lot of time to plan, certainly doesn't leave a lot of time for 
community partners, uh, providers to plan. And we're asking them to do a lot. We're asking them to do it by appointment only, to really minimize waste, and to do all of that with just a few days notice of how much they're gonna get, sometimes if they're gonna get at all. So those are the operating parameters. We've, um, we've had a couple opportunities to communicate with the Biden administration, um, those challenges and our request to get at a minimum more notice on what we're gonna get. That has been echoed by almost every other state, um, has communicated the same things and um, the more notice that we're able to get, the better planning we're able to do. And um, that goes for our providers as well. We just don't have enough vaccine now to do big time mass volume events, um, but we certainly hope to get there, you know, hopefully within a month or a month and a half. Um, right now, there's just, you know, enough vaccine to, 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 to put it in all parishes and um, not enough to do the big centralized events. What we are trying to turn as much attention towards as possible is identifying gaps in the current vaccine availability framework. And whether it's geographic uh, locations, you know, areas of town that are not well served, either by there not being a vaccine provider in that area, or there being other barriers, or if it's particular communities that are not well served, We're working hard to identify those now and we do have some tools available to be able to direct vaccine to those areas as we identify them. We, we, we've been working hard to plan small strike teams with the Office of Public Health staff in conjunction with uh, National Guard and parish authorities. Those are being coordinated by the regional medical directors that are in each of the nine regions. And we also have some contractors that have lined up to do small scale strike teams into areas or communities that have not been well served yet with vaccine availability. Um, as folks identify those areas, and, and I, I'm looking to folks on, on this call to help us identify where those areas are, um, we can work with the respective regional medical director and, and find a way to rectify the situation. That's really our goal. Up until the point that we're able to do big mass events that's going to be one of the concerted goals going forward it is every week to do a better job directing vaccine to where folks have not yet been well served for for whatever reason it, it might be. I will say as a state, I think we're doing decently well moving vaccine um, as the CDC ranks it we're number 10th right now in states in terms of vaccines administered per capita. I would like to be number one, but again, I mean, for, for a state that's pretty cash strapped and certainly has not made the investments in public health um, year on year that some other states have. I, I think that that's, that's not too bad. It's, it's reflective of a lot of hard work that's been done. And I think the strategy that we've employed, which is setting up a broad network of community sites, will, will pay dividends for us down the road. To be frank, we know we can do the big events well. We, we, we drill and we practice for them all the time. Um, it's these smaller sites that are actually a little more challenging to get them enrolled. So. We're gonna have that done. A, a, a lot of states are gonna be caught flat-footed when it comes time to ramp up volume. As Dr. Phillips mentioned, we added some demographic information to the dashboard today. This is, um, this is a start. And just like was done with the initial COVID data, the, the, the COVID dashboard, we'll be able to add granularity and features to this um, as the weeks go on. Um, it, it is frustrating that there's a lot of, of, of gaps in the data right now. And, uh, particularly for for race, 56 percent of the of the of the, the pieces of information we have um, are either unknown or other race, which of course is not not accurate for the state. And so it's really hard to to really garner any conclusions from the data when just over half of it um, doesn't fall into the appropriate category. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of work to do on our end to reach out to providers, and it's just both hospitals and clinics and pharmacies, to ask that they pay more attention to entering in that data field. We do ask them for a lot of data fields. It's, it's required to us by the feds. And it's certainly, you know, when, when people are giving out vaccine, it's, it's not the shot that takes it all the time. It's, it's collecting all the data and entering the information. The providers will tell you it's quite a burden, but it is important because we, we just cannot track um, where vaccine is going geographically or certainly um, 
from an equity standpoint unless we get the data put in on the front end. So that's gonna be a concerted ask we make of vaccine providers from this point forward, that we, that we really need that data to be put in so that we can have visibility as a state and track this issue. And I would ask those on the phone to, to make that same ask of, of, of vaccine providers that you might be associated with. Um, it's a required field, but I think it's easy enough for someone if they're feeling rushed to just enter in other and move on. And, and we got to make sure that we communicate strongly that, that we need that data after it. Um, beyond that, um, <clears throat> I will say that the experience overall has been has been quite well. We've kept waste and loss to to a minimum. We've we've lost about 280 doses of vaccine so far, and with over 300,000 administered, that's that's relatively encouraging. Some other states have lost in the thousands. We'll continue to do what we can to minimize that. Um, and again, the, the big focus going forward for the next few weeks until we can stand up these mass events is to identify where we need to do a better job putting vaccine and then operationalizing that. That's going to be task number one for us going forward. Dr. Brown, I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause there, but I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cantor, Dr. Phillips. Um, are there any questions um, that you all would like to present? Yes, this is Margarita. Thanks very much. Um, I, I know we have limitations in supplies, but we are right now planning an event for the Latino community here in New Orleans. Uh, we expect to have around 200, 300 people still looking at the process. Uh, that will be in April 17. So is there any possibility to have that um, for April or is still too many limitations for that time? Do you have any idea? I think April is very realistic. Yeah. Oh, great, great. So I imagine I should contact you. <laughs> well, you contact me and, I, and I'll, I'll loop you in with our new medical director in the region one area, Dr. Chantal Abraham McGee. That sounds like a, like a good thing to plan for. Yeah, and it's specifically for Latino community and also in that venue we have said uh, may, now more, more African-Americans also doing a screening, a testing for COVID. Every Saturday, around 100 people screening. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Cantor, one of the uh, issues that have come up has to do with the forms that the um, individuals have to fill out as it relates to ethnicity. Uh, a plausible uh, reason why you have so much in the other category is some of the feedback that I'm getting from the community is that one of the choices is for race is listed as African and not African-American. And so this is what I'm hearing that they're putting other because there was no option that said African-American on some of the forms that they had to fill out at some of the local pharmacies. Have you all looked into that? Yeah, we are looking into it um, and have heard that same thing, uh, Dr. Brown. So thank you for sharing what, what, what you did share on that. Um, and it looks like that particular entity, it, they don't have a race category. It looks like they just have an ethnicity category. And so we are working with that provider and it is one of the larger, larger chain providers. So that's one of the pieces that we are working on. Um, and from that, we're going to see, you know, if there are other providers who have forms that are similar to that, that could, you know, potentially be contributing to the same thing. And, and also uh, in the form I signed, it was interesting because there was the category was black or African-American white. That was the category. I think that is missing uh, the box. And so when I signed it, I just had to put an additional box there. So people uh, can use very easy and reported or refuse to report. I am reading the for right now. 
And Miss Margarita, can you can you email us that provider that um, that you had that encounter with so we can look into that as well? And then as you all are getting this information, it's helpful for us um, so that way we can start digging into it. And I think it's just a typo in the form. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting because we have making jokes about the classification when people complete the form. Yeah, and I think we're going to have to put some guidance out to our provider, just like we did um, in the last um, health alert um, notice that went out in terms of here are the fields, the federal fields that we submit via our links immunization system, and that we would want them to mirror some of that, that, that same information. So we will, we will put out some guidance related to that. And I think it'd be helpful. I mean, once we write that up, then we can run it through, um, you know, Dr. Libby, Dr. Brown, if you all would, you know, lay some eyes on it and provide some feedback. But I think it would be helpful for us to put that guidance out to our providers. Um, but as you all have, you know, sites and entities that you're hearing about, that, that helps us um, very much so. I mean, Dr. Brown, I think the, the day after or that night we had the conversation, you heard it just from a conversation. I heard it from a couple of our councils on aging. And so I, I think it's important as you're hearing things in the community that we can jump on and dig into that kind of answers the question of maybe what's going on. We know there's some other reasons as well, but for the ones that we're able to solve and dig into, we, we want to be able to jump on those. You know, another issue that we have to be really careful about is um, communication, messaging, and narrative. Um, I just finished an interview with a reporter who wanted to, was, was working on a story about North Baton Rouge, saying that there was only one, one site in North Baton Rouge and that that community was underserved. Um, and so she didn't have a lot of the background and nuance about exactly you know how um, the vaccine is being distributed i tried to clear up some of that to, to help her have a better understanding of how it all operates but she just as easily could have and when she when she reached out to me she didn't know that i was co-chair of this task force she just reached out to me as a researcher who's been working on these issues and um uh, and if she had done that with somebody else who wasn't on the task force and who hadn't been in a conversation with you just the other day about these issues you know, we really could have had a, a narrative, an unfortunate narrative go out that really could have led to even more distrust and uh, made the task of getting everyone vaccinated even more difficult. So um, I don't know exactly what's happening in North Baton Rouge, but I think it's, you know, the, 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 the location of the sites where the vaccine is being distributed. And, you know, we have this medical care infrastructure that is segregated and you know we have these medical deserts and you yeah. know and this is every state every part of the country has this problem but we just need to be i think uh, messaging around that and that you know that uh, how we're going to go about ensuring that even though there isn't a hospital or uh, some other facility in a in particular neighborhood we're going to ensure that everyone in every neighborhood has an equitable opportunity to get vaccinated yeah, no, I think that's great. I mean, that, that's absolutely great feedback. We do need to do a better job in terms of the communicating that. And sometimes what folks don't see, you know, in those listings is that you may have a site that um, an entity who's located one place, who's actually doing uh, vaccines for a location that's not in their community. So recently we had the East Baton Rouge Council on Aging partnering with um, the Albertsons on Burbank. Um, and so they they came to their location. So that, that's something that's not seen just when you're looking at the spreadsheet in terms of available sites. But North Baton Rouge is one of the areas where we see that there's a healthcare provider desert. So one of the, the pilots that we're gonna be looking at for next week, and again, vaccine supply is a limiting factor. But one of the things we wanna look at, and Dr. Cantor uh, mentioned this, is our community strike teams and using one of our contracted partners to set up a site in a specific community that could, that is gonna be an underserved area um, and look at what does it look like in terms of making that arrangement, doing appointments. Um, it's gonna be a limited amount because it's gonna be a, a test pilot. We'll do one in the urban area and then one in a rural location. The urban area will be the North Baton Rouge area um, to see how that works, um, You know what logistics we need to work through, what kinks would be in place um, before we start rolling this out across the state. So I think that's another piece that you know we definitely would like you guys to be looped in on um, to kind of help us out in. Would it be possible? Oh, to get, would it be possible to get talking points that can go out to everyone on this task force, so that if we are approached by the media, we'll at least have you know the background information? You know, because if you and I hadn't talked the other day, I really would not have been in a position to you know to kind of clarify some things for the reporter, and a, a really negative story could have gone out. Um, 
Yeah, we definitely can do, we can definitely do um, ongoing talking points. I mean, maybe weekly or every other week to do a push out. Um, and then you all can push it out to all the, the task force members. If y'all are open to that, we definitely could do that. That's a great idea. That's Dr. Wilson, make another point. One of the other complaints is uh, the boundaries that people are saying elected officials from different parishes, that their parish is being slighted. And what's what's happening to people, the virus knows no boundaries and people know no, no, no boundaries. So people that are closer to one parish on the parish line, if you will, they're going over and getting uh, or, or enrolling or getting the vaccine. It's not uh, 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 corralled by a zip code, if you will. So when we started tracking, you know, we had some, we have 16 sites and people are coming from different sites into the parishes that where the home uh, for community health center, where the home base may have it available and not distribute it to all the sites yet. They're coming across. So as we're tracking, that, that's becoming a challenge to track uh, and give the feedback to those parish officials the same, look, our people don't have access. Well, they really are getting it because they're going uh, to other places and getting it. So that's a, that's another factor that you need to look at when you start getting those calls, as I know you're getting mm -hmm. from elected officials, that um, that's part of the strategy, I think, is to make sure that it makes no sense if you're you know, one mile away from a vaccination site and they, the one in your parish is 20 miles away, the, the people are going to go to the nearest one. Yeah, and that is a question that we got early on is if, if you're limited to re receiving um, the vaccine within your parish, and, and we, we don't, I mean, specifically for right. what, what you just laid out. Um, you know, we had some parishes early on that didn't have any enrolled sites. And so we really looked at, you know, what were those closer areas, closer parishes, until we can get an enrolled partner in there. But, but there are situations, regardless of what providers you have enrolled, it's going to be closer to go to a neighboring parish. And it is right. in your own community based on what's on the line. Um, but that that is a good point when we're when we're looking at in terms of where doses have been allocated, where doses are administered, because that's going to cross over. And so those numbers won't always line up when you look at the per capita information. So that's another piece we probably need to spell out in our talking points that that, that we can add into that. We, um, um, this is Chris Nagel with the YMCA. Uh, I just want to let you guys know as well that nationally the YMCA is partnering with CVS um, to administer. Uh, vaccination. So that's going to be happening here in Baton Rouge soon. Um, and then also we're working with two of our hospital partners um, for a couple of our locations to become vaccination sites as well. And that's going to happen in the next few weeks. And one of those will be the Y in North Baton Rouge. So that'll be a, an area that we know is, is going to be an access point as well. And uh, I would encourage if any of the connections to let me know, we can connect you to the Ys throughout the state as well that all have the ability and resource to become a center as well. So so hopefully in the next couple of weeks, that's going to be launching. We're, we're getting all the details now and kind of finalizing everything now. Oh, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Christian, let me ask, are you all um, for the North Baton Rouge? And I heard you mention you all are partnering with Albertsons. Are, for some of the sites, are you are you becoming an enrolled site or just partnering with a medical site that that's going to be the location of? Right. So we're, so we're not partnering with Albertsons. The, the national partnership is with CVS. Um, and CVS has oh, identified okay. the locations that they want to use. Uh, the locations that they are not using are the ones that our two local hospital partners are going to going to use as sites. So they'll administer all of that. We'll just be the host facility and, I guess, in essence, making it convenient for the community and providing access and that kind of thing. Okay. No, thank you for that. I just wanted to make sure if y'all were enrolling that we were on the lookout for that provider enrollment. One of the things that we're yeah. doing is try to streamline because we have heard a lot in terms of the number of enrollment applications for the immunization system and to be a COVID <clears throat> provider enrollment. Um, I think Dr. Cantor mentioned right. that we have over 1800 sites that are currently enrolled and several that are in the process. And so that is that, that is okay. overwhelming the system. So we are setting right. up an 800 line that folks can actually call. It was an email box, um, but at least yeah. they have had somebody to talk to to understand in terms of where their application is in the process, what's working, what's not yeah. working. So just wanted to share that in the event that that's yeah. where you're headed. Yeah, now all of it will go through the hospitals. We're we're just literally going to be the place and the host site. Great, great. That's great news, Christian. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. And to be equitable and, and to be transparent, uh, I think the task force should be involved with who decides uh, where uh, the, the immunizations, are, the vac vaccination are given out. Because right, right now, if the why... If they're trying to service North Baton Rouge, I serve in North Baton Rouge. No one's ever asked me, did I want to give shots? I mean, and we're doing, we're seeing independent pharmacies 
It's supposed to be CVS and Albertsons. Now you're seeing independent pharmacies are getting ready to give shots. I know in some other states, that's that's what's going on. And we should, as for the task force, draw up um, those pockets of big uh, African-American populations and decide who could best service those, um, those people uh, equitably. And um, there may be some independent physicians who uh, wouldn't mind and who would who would like to be involved with that. But it's always that we're chasing behind something. Someone's made a decision before we even get to the table. So um, my I, I've been involved. I've been here 30 years. I got a very, very large practice. No one's called me in, uh, and said anything, but somebody can open up a care south next door that's been open eight months and they're probably getting ready to give the shots. So try, we already have, we don't have to remake the wheel. We have physicians that could give um, the vaccines. We, we have call lists that we could, we could get to people much quicker than any, anybody else starting off. I mean, I can hit, I can hit a button and pull up um, 20,000 people and I can do it by age. And the most other physicians that are e got an EMR, they could do it also. So utilize what we have instead of uh, going around the medical community and without us ever being involved with the decision making and then someone else is deciding what's best for black people and we've been taking care of black people all along. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Banks, and more than happy to get the Equity Task Force feedback in terms of as we push out our list on a weekly basis. Um, if you all look at the previous list and say, you know, here are some recommendations that we have as you're doing your planning for the following week, more than happy to accept that information and to factor it into the planning. In terms of reaching out to providers in terms of they're interested, um, we, we pushed out health alert networks, uh, alerts uh, to, to all providers in terms of the enrollment process. And I don't know if you've started the process for your physician clinic. And if you haven't, more than happy to talk to you offline of what their process is and how to go about it. Because if you're in an underserved area, we, we are looking for providers who are interested in terms of enrolling via links as well as the COVID provider enrollment. Um, so more than happy to connect with you to walk through what that process looks like. Um, but again, we have more than 1,800 providers who are enrolled. Right now, we're only pushing out to about 400 providers. That includes hospitals pharmacies, both independent and chains. And that is intentional. We, we didn't intend to only work with chains and I'll, I'll touch upon that. Also FQHCs and we do have some physician clinics who are included in that. So if you are, if you would like to get enrolled, I'm more than happy to have the conversation of walking through that process with you. In terms of the chains and independence, as I shared, we do have a, a mix and we wanna have a mix in terms of chains and independence because independents oftentimes are in communities that you may not have a chain. Um, also, some of the chains are only doing online um, application and registration and appointment setting. And we do know for the current population, 70 plus, sometimes that is a challenge in terms of that online um, form to, to set an appointment. And so those independents have allowed online, I mean, phone system, phone call in system. And so they have been extremely helpful. And we've tried a couple of different models. So we, we intend to keep both independents and in chains and to continue to add other providers within that. But more than happy to work with you to get you enrolled and to see what we can do. Dr. Phillips, would this align with what you had discussed with us, the social vulnerability map? That yes, ma'am. Probably yes, ma'am. With the task yes. force? Okay. Yeah. So what we do, um, and as Dr. Kander, he, he touched upon in terms of how quickly um, our numbers, um, we get our allocation. So on Tuesdays, we get um, a draft allocation from our federal partners that tells us what we're going to have in terms of our allocated doses for the state. And that's on Tuesday and it's draft numbers where we're, they, they make sure that that disclaimer is on there. And so we try to start our planning process with those draft numbers with the understanding that the final numbers come in Thursday. And again, those numbers could adjust from what we know on Tuesday. This past two weeks, they have been the same, um, but previous weeks they have not been the same. And so we always are trying to shift at the last minute based on these changes that may happen between the estimated numbers and the confirmed numbers. On Thursday afternoon, when we get our numbers, we have to load into the, the federal system of where the allocations are going. And so we have between the afternoon and Thursday night to load the system in terms of where the allocations are going, which is not much time for our providers at all for us to call them to say, here's our allocated numbers. Are you able to take on, you know, here's what we're looking at. And so it's a very quick time frame, um, you know, and our providers have, have expressed concern around that and rightfully so. 
We've shared that with our federal partners, have advocated for at least getting a couple of weeks in advance in terms of what that allocation uh, number would be so we can do uh, a little bit more advanced planning. That has not happened to date. Um, when that does happen, then we are able to give providers a little bit more uh, advanced notice. We also you know, have encouraged providers to not set up appointments ahead of time because those numbers come on a weekly basis. And so that's another challenge for providers. As you mentioned, Mr. Banks, you know, you, you have a litany of individuals you serve who, who you could tap into and probably set appointments for weeks in advance. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have our allocation that far in advance. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Is there any other questions that you all would like to present? Yes, I have a question about the cost to the patient for the vaccine. And let me give a scenario. There was a lot of confusion about the uh, whether the patient would be um, charged for the testing. And in some instances, patients were not charged. And in some instances, they were. In one scenario that I'm aware of, a patient went to have a COVID-19 test and just recently received a bill for over $200 from that provider for um, going there and getting that test. And um, it's my understanding that, that uh, it, what it appears is that they processed him as a, uh, as a patient seeking medical care, a doctor's visit, rather than someone who was walking in to get just a test, a COVID test. And so I'm asking the question about uh, the vaccine, will patients be charged and will providers be allowed to um, bill them uh, for that service and bill their insurance for a, a visit, a medical visit? Okay, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. We, we as a department have more agency in this than we did with testing because we are sending vaccine to providers. So we have some, some control over that. The answer is no. Uh, patients will not, should not be charged. If anyone hears of that happening, that's something that Dr. Phillips and myself want to know about ASAP. There is a reimbursement fee that a provider has available to them through insurance. And so it is acceptable for a vaccine provider to ask for someone's insurance. If someone is uninsured, or chooses not to share their insurance, that cannot be a barrier to being served. The provider actually still has a way to recoup that fee. It's not very much, it's about 43 bucks for the two dose series, weighed a little bit heavier towards the second dose, but the feds have set up a portal and the feds will basically make providers whole. So if they give a vaccine to someone who is uninsured or underinsured or doesn't share their insurance information, that vaccine provider can, can go recoup that fee directly from the feds. There can be no barrier to the patient in terms of insurance status or, or lack thereof. Furthermore, and I think this is part uh, Mr. Roy, of what you are getting at, a provider, let's say a primary care clinic, cannot make vaccine contingent on a full patient visit. So they cannot say, yeah, I'll vaccinate you, but I've got to bill you for the whole patient visit. They can offer a patient visit but they cannot make the vaccination contingent on, on that, nor can they limit vaccine to only their patients anyway. They have to do it to anyone. And we will investigate clinics that we get reports of to the contrary. I think on the front end, some guidance to the providers who are getting the vaccine might be in order so that that does not happen because it catches the patients off guard and the patients don't know that they're not supposed to be being billed. They assume that they're going in that there will not be a cost to them and then they get this bill and they're shocked and they don't know what to do with it. And we definitely, we, we have pushed communication out. We definitely can do a reminder in the next uh, health alert notice. But again, as, as you all are hearing about this, it, it allows us to be able to track down immediately and reach out to that provider. We have had, I think maybe one or two reports of that that we were able to, to intervene and jump on top of. So as you all hear that, please, you can shoot it to me, Dr. Kander, directly so we can, we can get our immunization investigators involved and start making some calls around it. Other, other point of concern is in the forms, the request for your social security number. Yeah. So if you don't have one, we don't know what to do. That, uh, Margarita, that's a great point. We are required by the feds to ask the question. Um, if we don't do due diligence or ask our providers to do due diligence and asking that question, the feds can restrict vaccine to us. 
a patient is under no obligation to give the number mm -hmm. and the provider cannot bar service to someone for not providing the social security number. So there should not be any, any barrier in that regard to someone who doesn't have a social security number who may be undocumented, but the provider is required to ask the question. And it's, uh, that's, that's, that's the feds rule. Dr. Brown, there's and one, um, there's, I see, I just saw a question just popped up in the, the chat in terms of, um, and it's a very good question. And I am curious in terms of um, some, some input on this. And it's about the monoclonal uh, antibody in, in infusion therapy and us doing a better job of informing um, underserved communities to ensure uh, equitable access around this. And so we, we have, we pushed out general information, but are there some specific ideas of how we can do a better job of really pushing this out in terms of underserved communities to make sure people are really aware of what the monoclonal antibody is and how they can have access to it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Phillips, Dr. Cantor, um, for providing us with an update. Uh, we will have you as a standing agenda item uh, for our future uh, meetings so that you can um, present any updates and then we can share any um, input that we can provide so that we're working synergistically to, to move this initiative. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Do, do y'all have any feedback on that question? And I agree with you, uh, Dr. Phillips and Dr. Wiltz. It wasn't advertised in our community and the local hospital uh, unfortunately sat on it for a week before we, we knew about it and they had a limited quality. And when we, first, when we learned of it, we spread it among, you know, it just locally and got it used, but it's not being advertised. So um, uh, I, I don't know how we can get that out. Uh, that's a huge tool. The, the patients that we did send, send uh, you know, there are people that are not sick enough hours to be hospitalized, that they go in and the parameters, uh, there, there, are, there are some criteria that there was a fact sheet that uh, UMC in New Orleans put out, and then we created our own little fact sheet That's what we did. And we just blast it out to our providers, but it's not being massively uh, communicated. So, so, um, so we can push out some information directly to to providers. Um, but I'm wondering, how do we do a better job to the public um, in the communities? Yeah, you got to empower them because if they don't ask for, it's the same thing like in the beginning. I think a lot of our folks, a lot of minority patients, were seen in the ER and sent home. It sort of reminds me of some of, you know, they're not, not, not that they, they weren't being taken seriously, but they don't know that that is an opportunity. And um, maybe the health alert that Dr. Cantor, that you all put out, that might be for the providers, to the public, I guess we have to do it the same campaign we're mm -hmm. doing for getting tested and vaccinations, that this is one more tool in the toolkit. And um, yeah, uh, we might have to work directly with some community providers to push out some of those 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 fact sheets, maybe directly to community partners um, in, in in the communities. So that, maybe we'll try that approach. But if anybody has any additional ideas around that, please uh, uh, let let us know. We'll put some work into that. Okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Brown. Thank you. No, no, Dr. Maupin, did that address what you had in the chat? I think. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's an area, obviously, you know, it's a different space than the vaccination space. But, you know, my sense is that a lot of this, the communication has really been word of mouth, um, you know, and that, you know, they're going to be providers or certain hospitals that communicate it to maybe, you know, more privileged populations. And so I think the, the onus is really to make sure that we do have a mechanism uh, for empowering patients with this information at the community level. Because, you know, again, as was noted by you know, one of the other members, you know, if patients don't ask, a lot of times they won't be informed. Um, and I know there's, there are national reports that this is actually a very under, underutilized resource across the country, that, you know, this was rolled out and they thought, that they, thought they were going to be lines for it. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of sitting there going to waste. And, you know, for those individuals who meet criteria, um, it can keep folk out of the hospital and out of the ICU. Um, and so it's, it is a different issue, but I think it's also just as important um, as our, you know, for those who are affected by COVID, you know, as our vaccine strategy. So community messaging really needs to be um, ramped up in this space. All right, absolutely. We'll, we will definitely take that. And you're right. Many states have underutilized their, their allotment. Um, 
thankfully in the last several weeks, our state, that, that, that has not been us. And we have been able to get increased supply um, based on what the demand has been in the state from other states who have not utilized their allotment. So I, I think we're in a little bit different situation from some other states, but clearly we have some work to do in terms of the, the equitable uh, piece of this. So we'll put some effort into that. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, we'll move next to Dr. Uh, Earl Benjamin Robinson, an update on LDH and the health equity dashboard. Uh, his co-chairs of that subcommittee um, is Dr. Demetrius Porce and Ms. Judy Reese Morris. Dr. Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin is muted. Sorry guys. Uh, so the uh, dashboard has uh, up and developed. It is not open yet. Uh, it is not live. It's, uh, uh, it's only available via a password. Uh, these are, uh, this is what it looks like. It's still not finalized yet. Um, we are in, I met with Secretary Robinson and uh, the director of the Bureau of Planning and Performance. And so we are in the process of uh, getting a contract with Policy League and our Urban League. And we will be utilizing them via that contract to add additional uh, tools inside the uh, dashboard. But presently, this is what the dashboard looks like. I'm not gonna really go through it, uh, but this is just a superficial look at it. Um, but it does break out information specific to each region. Um, the formation of the data is specific to um, the uh, Prevention Institute and Robert Wood Johnson's framework around foundation of community health, where it looks at opportunity, people, place, and health, and it breaks down the health journey from the perspective of foundation of health community, uh, and it goes from exposure and behavior to medical conditions to health inequities. And so I'll just to give you a brief example, uh, looking at demographics. And so looking at demographics, I can go to each region. And so I'll go to region one, breaking down demographics. Uh, I'm a little slow today. Well, anyway, uh, due to the sake of time, the website is uh, ready. Uh, we have not released to the public yet. Um, we are developing a contract with Urban League and Policy Link. Uh, that contract will be finalized probably by next week. Uh, the work that uh, uh, Policy Link and Urban League will be doing will be to add additional tools uh, to uh, the website. And so I will be reporting more information soon. Uh, Judy, is there, Judy and uh, Dr. Porch, is there anything that you want to add to? Um, this. Are they on the call? Oh, they may not be on the call. Uh, Dr. Brown, for the sake of time, because I, I have to jump off and go to something else. Do you want me to go ahead and do the other? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, so let me stop this and open my other document. So that was just an update of the health equity dashboard, which was one of our charges to develop um, that uh, Dr. Benjamin has spearheaded. While he's getting his slides ready, he will move right into uh, giving us an update of the vaccine outreach to minority communities. Right, thank you. And so this outreach is related to the work that's taking place inside uh, my office, the Office of Community Partnerships and Health Equity. And so uh, since the uh, beginning of uh, COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic inside the state, um, we have had uh, created a listserv, listserv uh, that um, we have two, three of them. One is uh, centered around the ambassadors. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we created a listserv of ambassadors. These are individuals who 
uh, who self-identified. They're individuals from around the state. We have about 98 of them uh, and they work inside organizations or they are community people who uh, wanted more information about COVID. And so we initially started providing training and information and resources to them uh, related to COVID. We send them information on a monthly to weekly basis related to COVID. And so whenever there are uh, new talking points that come from the Bureau of Media and Communication inside LDH, we send them that information. Whenever there's new information coming from CDC, we send them that information so that they are informed and they can share their information within their respective communities. Uh, a significant portion of these ambassadors are uh, African-American or Black individuals. We also have a listserv of faith-based uh, uh, individuals, and these are uh, pastors from around the uh, state. Again, a significant portion of these individuals are uh, African-American, and we also have a Hispanic listserv, uh, and we send uh, information to them as well. And so this, uh, li these listservs were created initially uh, when the uh, pandemic first started inside uh, the state and we developed them because we knew we needed to get information to uh, some of the most vulnerable populations immediately uh, as related to COVID. And so another thing that was developed like uh, two months ago was a uh, uh, communications ad council. And so we brought together uh, a diverse group of communication stakeholders from around the state, from north, south, east, west, of Louisiana and some key uh, African-American or black members that uh, preside on this body are from, we have representation from uh, Grambling State University, uh, Dr. Eric Griggs is on it, Dr. Bear, Dr. Alicia uh, Battles uh, from Tulane University and a part of the Skin Your In campaign is uh, a part of it and membership uh, from uh, Together Louisiana are on it. And so these individuals, these are uh, the African-American representation that uh, exists on this body. And the significance of this body is uh, they help to inform uh, a lot of, uh, not just the, 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 uh, the vaccine communication, but the overall uh, communication that is, uh, that BMAC, LDH's BMAC is uh, in development. And so they help to inform uh, that communication. And they also get to share what it is that they're sharing are creating inside uh, their respective communities in relationship to COVID-19. Uh, this is significant because, uh, you know, with uh, the COVID vaccines, uh, there's a tremendous amount of distrust. And so we really all need to be on the same page. And so if we all are able to get on the same page, that helps uh, to ensure uh, that, you know, uh, information is, uh, is uh, more easily um, uh, able for people are more likely to uh, receive the information if we're all saying the same thing. They're more likely to trust the information if we're all saying the same thing. And this is a meeting that happens on a monthly basis uh, where uh, all of the um, uh, communication stakeholders uh, from some from LSU, some from Louisiana Tech, uh, but the ones that I have listed here are, some, are the African American representation uh, representatives uh, that provide great insight uh, to BMAC about uh, what they have going on and uh, provide feedback to BMAC about what they think should be happening in relationship to the African-American experience. Uh, starting this year, uh, we've been in development of this for the past um, a few weeks. Uh, we are developing four COVID-19 vaccine advisory councils. Um, uh, these four, uh, of the four, one is a healthcare advisory council, one is a public sector advisory council, one is a faith-based advisory council, and one is a communities advisory council. Uh, you can see in some of these areas, uh, we have some of the listed uh, organizations that will be part of these advisory councils. The significance of these bodies is to help uh, we're going to be sending information to them. We're also going to be getting feedback from them. Uh, in each of these advisory councils, uh, African Americans, uh, gatekeepers, uh, organizations have a part to play, and we'll be getting feedback from them. We'll also be sharing information with them in hopes that they will be distributing that information. Uh, specifically, uh, these uh, advisory councils are COVID-19 vaccine specific, so a lot of this uh, uh, synergy and uh, efforts will be centered around the vaccine. And so we're trying to uh, 
as it relates to the COVID-19 vaccine campaigns, we're trying to be, we're using these uh, ad councils to be flexible and to get information in real time about what that campaign should look like so that we can respond real quickly uh, because at the end of the summer, we really uh, want to have uh, uh, moved people from that pre-contemplative stage of, you know, I don't want the vaccine to a contemplative stage or to action in relationship to getting the vaccine. And so there are four uh, key um, uh, objectives of uh, these uh, advisory councils. Again, it's healthcare, uh, public sector, faith-based and communities, but they, they all have four key roles. Share information and resources um, with uh, their leads, uh, provide insight and feedback, uh, about LDH messaging. Uh, uh, they will be convened on a, uh, via emails. They will only meet occasionally or as they need to. Uh, and they um, will be sharing nuanced information with uh, their leads. And that nuanced information will be shared with LDH ASAP so that we can make certain that we are getting information real time back as it relates to uh, communication, uh, messaging, uh, so that you know we're, we're creating the right message as it relates to vaccine, because there's a tremendous amount of hesitancy, particularly in, in the African American community, and we want to get ahead of that as much as we can. I don't know if you guys had an opportunity to see a um, the webinar that uh, we executed today, today um, COVID-19 vaccines, a conversation with the African American community. Um, I want to uh, thank. Um, uh, Dr. Um, um, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm sorry, uh, Derek. Um, my I just got braces, and so I'm having a hard time uh, pronouncing names and stuff. Uh, please, I might butcher your last name. Uh, Varis, I believe, Dr. Varis, uh, for his insight in helping to shape uh, the one pager. But uh, we uh, executed this uh, webinar today. Uh, I want to thank my staff, uh, the uh, Dr. Um, Brown, Dr. Leviste, uh, and everyone who helped to bring it together. The significance of this webinar uh, was we know that there's a tremendous amount of vaccine hesitancy that exists inside of the African-American community and the African-American experience this summer. Uh, Louisiana Public Health Institute uh, did some surveys and they found that the, inside the African-American community, well, those African-Americans who completed the survey, 49% uh, of them indicated uh, that they would probably, and Shalini, correct me if I'm wrong, they indicated that they would probably uh, take uh, the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine. And so, I mean, uh, that that's, uh, I, I, I was wishing that it would be higher than that, but that, that speaks to the hesitancy that is there. And so uh, after learning about that data that uh, the LPHI shared with us and hearing nationally about um, the hesitancy that you know we were hearing nationwide, we knew, uh, and looking at the other data that, that exists inside the state, we knew that we needed to do something. We knew uh, hearing many African-Americans, hearing individuals inside my family, hearing individuals inside my colleague's family say, you know, I'm not gonna get vaccinated and hearing the reasons why, we knew we needed to have a real conversation. And so inside this webinar, we wanted to reiterate the facts, but we also wanted to create the room to really share and have discussions about the earned mistrust. And so that's what we did today. We brought gatekeepers together and we shared factual information and we created space uh, to have a discussion about, uh, about the earned mistrust. And so I, I, I think Dr. Sizer, I think Terry Sterling, I think Dr. Davis, Dr. Griggs, Dr. Ricks, and Dr. Abair for uh, really helping to create a, a marvelous event that I think will be a benefit uh, all year because this was recorded and we will be distributing it uh, throughout the state. Uh, and we created it in such a way that um, we want people to uh, replicate what they see in the discussion. We also created a one pager to be a complement to it. And so uh, on the one pager, there are three, four areas uh, that uh, we want to help. I mean, we want uh, we put on it so that people can leave the conversation equipped to have uh, factual discussions. And so on that one pager that people will get immediately following the webinar are the facts. 
Uh, the facts are the best way to protect your family is masking up, stay six feet away from people, wash your hands and receive approved uh, FDA uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Now, inside the conversation on the webinar, we didn't tell people what to do. We were just presenting factual information. We also talked at length about the earned mistrust. And we also shared, and I think this was some of the most important things, one of, at least uh, just as important as the factual information that we shared, we also shared how to share COVID-19 um, information. And we stress that do not mix rumors and myths with factual information. If you are looking at COVID-19 information on social media, only visit sites that share factual information, I mean that fact check and verify the information and only share information from trusted websites. And so uh, this will not be the only one. Uh, in the future, there will be three more. Um, there will be a faith-based uh, webinar that we will have. There will also be one for Hispanics and there will also be uh, one for providers, helping providers to uh, discuss the earned distrust uh, that exists in uh, communities. Because at the end of the summer, we really want to have done uh, our due diligence to have pushed uh, people from that pre-contemplative stage of be our, our being on the fence regarding uh, the vaccines to, to a point of contemplation and action. Lastly, uh, inside our office, uh, uh, we, my office is uh, in a partnership with uh, Tulane's uh, Lasile uh, project. Uh, and so we have seven um, individuals that are presently doing assessments uh, with uh, Tulane uh, after, and those assessments will be done by the end of this month. But once those assessments are done, uh, these individuals, and these individuals are in the Baton Rouge, the New Orleans, the Monroe, the Keith Field, the Alexandria area. Once these individuals have completed their assessments with the project, they will be going in their respective communities. Again, these individuals are statewide. They will be going in their respective communities and sharing information about uh, COVID vaccines. And so we're going to be training them on how to deliver, using that one page that you just saw, training them on how to deliver factual information uh, about COVID vaccine. Uh, there will be more to come um, in the near future. And when uh, we have outlined uh, those strategies and made uh, and finalized what those strategies will look like, I will uh, share them over with you guys then. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin, for your outstanding work and leading the efforts um, with the Health Equity Dashboard and um, this outreach to minority communities. Um, we, we thank you so much. Uh, are, is there a time for a brief question? Is there any questions for Dr. Benjamin? All right, thank you again. Uh, at this point, we'll have an update from one of the hardest working subcommittees, I should say the most entertaining mm -hmm. subcommittee, uh, the communications and messaging subcommittee. Um, they have been working diligently uh, putting out messaging and, and communications and billboards and videos and they're going and they've also uh, been serving as an advisory to LDH uh, sort of screening um, some of the messaging that's going out there to make sure it's uh, culturally sensitive and relative and so I'll have Dr. Um, Derek Riveras who's co-chair uh, present and his co-chair is um, Dr. Corey Abair. Dr. Rivera. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Brown. And uh, I, I would, would like to again, acknowledge uh, the committee, the subcommittee that's been working on this. We've been at it pretty steadily. Um, I had a few technical difficulties with the PowerPoint. So I got my partner in crime, uh, the, uh, the irreplaceable Janine Tate, who will be assisting me with the slides. So Janine, if you can move to the next slide, please. And the subcommittee, as you can see, consists of uh, a very diverse group of folks. Uh, Ms. Lenore Caro, who uh, uh, was, was so gracious to join us on our subcommittee. Uh, she is a member of the uh, United Home and Nation, and she is also on the staff at the United Home and Nation. 
headquarters. She is a, a phenomenal contributor and a, a, com, a complete uh, team player who represents not only the uh, United Homa Nation and, and Native peoples in the state, but also uh, has a keen in, insight for uh, communication uh, and, and getting messaging out. The, the, the one and only Dr. Keith C. Ferdinand, which you've heard from before and you'll see a little bit later. You've heard a lot about Corey Abair, Councilwoman Helena Moreno, um, who also uh, works with the Hispanic uh, uh, community in, in greater New Orleans. Uh, she has been assisted by um, our newest committee member, uh, Ms. Sadie Finkel, uh, Cindy, Councilwoman Cindy Wynn, who um, uh, also has uh, outreach for our Vietnamese community. Um, she hasn't been as involved, but we continue to work with, with all of our populations, myself, the aforementioned Janine Tate as well as the two ex-official members. The next slide. So a quick snapshot, as I mentioned, it's a very diverse committee that, by the way, I don't know how the other subcommittees are doing, but we've been meeting weekly. Uh, we took a couple of breaks at the Christmas holiday, but um, we've been meeting weekly on Thursday morning, early Thursday mornings before most of us go to work uh, to try and hammer out uh, communication pieces for, uh, for this task force and to try and get messaging to uh, these, these underrepresented populations across the state, the, the same messages that you've been hearing uh, uh, prior uh, throughout this uh, this uh, this meeting this afternoon and as well in our webinar earlier. Uh, we've had a, a focus on, of course, the, the, the big three, hand washing, wearing a mask and social distancing. And we're now adding the vaccination as a piece of, of, of information that is vital. Uh, there, there is no other alternative to, uh, to effectively get us through this. So vaccination is our, is our driver right now. As, as uh, Dr. Brown mentioned, we've used billboards, cable TV, social media, really relying heavily on, on the, the, the billboards and the social media. We have not done a lot of the TV and the radio uh, as of yet. Um, we've had uh, earned media as, as, as referred to uh, earlier, and those consist of interviews and appearances, and I'll share with you um, at, at the end of uh, some of those. Our campaigns have, have uh, evolved. We started with the It Ain't Over, message uh, and it has evolved to the now uh, you got to take the shot message um, uh, but that has been updated as as recently as about 12 30 this afternoon when, when I heard my, my neighbor uh, Dr. Davis talk about and I say neighbor because I live in the East kid uh, but when I heard her talk about facts not fears and that's been referenced a couple of times and we definitely want to make that part of our messaging I think that's a phenomenal phrase that um, part of why um, this afternoon's webinar um, was necessary is because there's a whole lot of misinformation. Um, but as, as you saw on Wednesday, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a new sheriff in town and it's a good, a, good, a good time for us to try and get factual information out to people and, and not to this, uh, uh, the misinformation that we've been seeing. Uh, again, you are familiar with our billboard locations. Um, and our social media goes across the state, of course, but our billboard locations, Baton Rouge, home of New Orleans and Shreveport. We have plans for Alexandria, uh, Lafayette and Lake Charles, but again, the um, billboard companies, uh, because of hurricane damage, uh, they have not been able to, to do a whole lot of advertising in those communities. And we hope to be able to get back out there as well um, uh, as the year progresses. Next slide, please. Here's a, here's a look at one of our, um, our uh, holiday campaign pieces. We got no volume. If you could uh, reshare the screen again, but this time click the option at the bottom of the box that says optimize for video, and then also the sound will, will come through as well. So unshare and then go back into reshare. But th this time when you go into reshare, a box will come up and it'll say optimize for video at the bottom. All right, adults, listen up. I know you want to have a big holiday celebration, but now is not the time. We are in the middle of a global pandemic. 
if we want normal holidays next year, we can't have big celebrations this year. So wear those masks, social distance, keep those hands washed, and let's get ready for 2021. Stay safe because it ain't over. This was one of our um, most popular spots, according to feedback All that right, we got. <clears throat> and and, and I, I don't know if it shows on your screen, but I saw uh, Dr. Corey Abear's picture pop up. That's the proud father of the young lady in that video. She did a great job, Corey. Uh, <laughs> we also did billboards. <laughs> and uh, you can see <clears throat> we created a campaign that said, stay safe at home for the holidays trying to encourage people not to go over the river and through the woods as we normally do to go visit grandma and all the rest, <clears throat> but to, to instead stay safe at home. And, and a number of people took, uh, took the message to heart. Um, we, we wrestled with this. When we first drew this up, it had um, a number of people around the table and, and, we, and we saw multi-generations and we said, no, no, that's not the message that we want to deliver. We want to de deliver a message that says, just, just listen, how about a Zoom? And, and, and as much as we, we do on these boxes, we can, we can do that with our families as well and stay safe. So this was a very, um, very, very well, well thought out message that we did bring. Next slide. Here's one of our other uh, holiday spots, a little 30 second spot. In this season, we're usually thinking about cranberry sauce, sweet potato pie, cornbread dressing, and fried turkey. But this year's a little bit different because we have to think about the people that prepared that food and the people that you've invited to your house to eat it. So what we need to do is continue to do the things that have gotten us here safely during this time. That's washing our hands, social distancing, and of course, wearing a mask. Happy holidays. I'll let you guys decide which of the- In this season, we job. usually thinking about- for my money, I, I think it was baby girl, but um, Dr. Griggs and uh, Dr. Abear have been putting together spots for us like this. And uh, we've been sharing those on social media and they've done a tremendous job um, with, with very short turnaround on many of these uh, as we work to, to get messaging out and, and, and across uh, to, to our, our, our various audiences. Thank you so much, Corey and, uh, and Eric for, for that work. Next slide. In this season, And so we moved to vaccinations and uh, we, we've used a lot of, of, of uh, platforms to get this message out. Uh, we had Dr. Davis at the uh, governor's press conference, uh, articles in, in The Advocate and uh, on NOLA.com with Dr. Levice and Dr. Ferdinand. Uh, 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 Dr. Ferdinand did an interview as well with WDSU um, where Corey is often featured. Um, giving information, uh, good solid advice uh, on, on um, uh, what, what's coming and, and, and how we can prepare ourselves, um, not just what we need to be doing now, but how we can prepare ourselves going forward. Uh, of course, we're using the, the, the twins, Facebook and Instagram, and, and we've already commented uh, mightily on today's uh, very informative webinar. Next slide, please. There you see a picture of the, the one and only, uh, the, the uh, highly respected Dr. Keith C. Ferdinand, who said, and I quote, COVID-19 vaccination is an individual choice, but appears overwhelm overwhelmingly safe and effective. The US will not get out of this pandemic without vaccines to protect ourselves and our loved ones. Um, I will tell you because I don't know if Keith is still on this call, but uh, Keith uh, initially uh, was, was very skeptical about this process. Um, the, the, the phrase warp speed was talked about this afternoon in the webinar and the speed at which this was trying to be developed uh, gave great, great pause. Uh, but as you can see, he was one of the first in line to get his vaccine um, and, um, and is a proponent, a very vocal proponent uh, for all of us to get vaccinated. Uh, we've got to get past this, the, 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 the myths, mm -hmm. uh, the mistruths and the half-truths. Uh, and get to those those facts that we talked about earlier. And so uh, clearly demonstrating uh, uh, his willingness to take a vaccine early, um, uh, hopefully leading others to do to do the same. Next slide, please. 
And so upcoming, uh, we're going to continue to advertise with the billboards. Uh, we're going to work on some TV spots and perhaps even radio, uh, as well as social media. Uh, the street level billboards and bus shelter uh, areas are uh, signage are, are places where we want to go forward in. Um, we recognize that right now, most of our outdoor advertising um, uh, are billboards that would require vehicles and not all of uh, the members of the community that we're trying to reach have vehicles. Some are on public transport, many are on public transportation. So that's why we're gonna to work toward bus shelters and uh, uh, street level billboards as well. Uh, we're gonna increase our, our, our media efforts. Uh, the stats to the left indicate we've reached over 86,000 people. Uh, uh, most engagements at 12,000, uh, almost 12.5 on uh, page likes uh, or percentages are up. You can see uh, a 1,200% increase in likes to our pages. And so that's just in uh, the last uh, uh, month since uh, Christmas. So uh, we're, we're stepping it up and we're going to continue to push to do more and more uh, to get our messaging out. And last slide. We ask that you all uh, follow us. Again, we've been on Facebook and Instagram uh, throughout uh, uh, this, this time. Uh, you see the, the uh, web addresses there. Simply like us, go to our pages and share if you can. Uh, but we're also um, uh, increasing our, our page on the, uh, YouTube. And uh, Janine has been instrumental in all of this. I, I can tell you very clearly and publicly that this work would not happen without the, 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 the fine skills and the, the multi-talents of, of Janine Tate. She's been phenomenal um, in getting this, this uh, information out. Um, she has, uh, has, has done this uh, for, for the duration as well. And we're so appreciative to her. But we'd ask that you all help us in getting that message out by again, following us, liking these pages uh, and sharing our information with others. And that uh, Dr. Brown concludes our report. Thank you so much, Janine, for slides. Thank you, thank you so much. Are there any brief questions for Dr. Rivera's? I have a couple of comments that I did not make. Uh, one is, um, uh, we, we, on one of our social media pages, there was a concern about outreach to all communities that, uh, that was uh, focused on the black community, but not the others. Uh, but as you can see in our committee uh, makeup, we've got outreach to, to various uh, ethnic communities. And you can also see in the ads as we place them that we, we try to include um, uh, various folks so that um, people will see themselves in the ad. Uh, we, 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 also want to focus on, on high risk groups. So we see multi-generational pictures and not just the happy young, uh, young people, but also our seniors and, and others um, engaged. One last comment, uh, there was some conversation as we entered, uh, you know, this time, any other year, we'd all be getting excited about Mardi Gras, um, but we decided very intentionally not to do a Mardi Gras themed ad campaign because we're trying to discourage people from gathering um, in, in the Mardi Gras fashion. We felt like if we did something, we thought about doing something with Mardi Gras Indians or maybe a second line parade, but we thought that would encourage people to gather and, and get them excited about that. And instead, uh, we're gonna kind of low key that part of our, our campaign. So that was planned, but we've, we've since decided to uh, forego that given the, the uh, restrictions that we see across the state. Thank you, thank you. Uh Dr. Rivera, what he failed to mention is that it, when they meet every morning, they start with music and they end with music. I think a little that party, a little party. Helps Gotta have some fun. Stimulate the creativity. Dr. Brown, I have a question, if I may. Yes, Dr. Anderson. Hey, Dr. Rivera, thank you. Hey, Christy, I'm, I'm really scared right now. I'm really scared. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I've been holding it. So yeah, you know, it's coming up. No, I just want to clarify because you said that, um, and I, maybe I missed it, but you said that the communication billboards in Lake Charles or what have you. And I just want to ask about like this, this part of, of, of uh, Southwest Louisiana, because I see a lot of focus on New Orleans and Baton Rouge, which I totally understand it's a large population, but I really feel like Lafayette, particularly Lake Charles, and I only I say that because I'm personally I'm you know I, I'm from there, and you know the hurricane has devastated Lake Charles. So just with communication, with just building them back, with vaccine, with 
all of that that I have been back and forth with just trying to get access for my parents, it's been so difficult. So I just was wondering what efforts can, you know, can we do, can, is your, your subcommittee doing to ensure that like Charles isn't lost in this, even Lafayette isn't, mm-hmm. you know, lost in, in a lot of this. Cause I just feel like it's, you know, it's closer. It's, it's not the New Orleans, it's not the Baton Rouge area. Like, Give us some. You, 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 you sound like a minister friend. You sound like a minister friend of mine from North Louisiana. Uh, we haven't forgotten you, babe. We will not. We okay. have not. And we are actually, uh, Janine and I talked about this earlier, reaching out to Lamar Advertising to see about getting those billboards uh, going because there has been enough time uh, to, to go back to those communities. And then the other piece that we have to do is to... Uh, and, and I appreciate your comments, and, and Dr. Anderson, you, you are absolutely right. Um, the state tends to, to, to wag to the tail of, you know, New Orleans or Baton Rouge, and we've got these other very important communities. And mm-hmm. so we want to make sure that our messaging is, is inclusive of, of the entire state. It gets a little tricky when you start looking at numbers. It does get a little tricky because we have uh, finite, you know, finances, so we can't put billboards on every corner in every city, but we will work hard to uh, to get that up. And I appreciate that. We'll take that up uh, first thing um, Thursday. Thank you. Okay, thank Can I you. chime in because um, as a native New Orleanian and having spent the last 40 years in St. Mary Parish, and in Franklin in particular, the homes of five governors of the state of Louisiana, um, you know, that there is a, a, a tendency that ha- there's a lot of activity that's going on I, that I guess probably isn't being shared with the uh, task force that is going on. Uh, I know my wife is co-anchor of the local cable TV program, and uh, we've been on there every morning doing sessions. There's a black radio station in Morgan City that we've been doing uh, material on. We did some activities on MLK Day. We're planning some stuff tying into Black History Month, which I think is a good segue to help get our message out. Uh, And when Dr. Abair talked about the history of vaccinations, I can tell you one of the selling points to decrease the vaccine hesitancy is to show a picture of Dr. Corbett, who Dr. Fauci credited with being the lead scientist. That alone has broken down so many barriers. Just I whip that out on my iPhone every time I go in the room and uh, the presentations that we're going just to allay that anxiety of, uh, again, reinforcing that this is not new technology. It's been developed all along. Uh, But there is still, there's a lot of work. We did some things uh, there's a communication team with the Lucille committee that uh, Dr. Brown and I are on that they're also doing some things that are posting. So it might be that um, maybe a more shared uh, communication of all these different activities that are going on in, in small communities. So to be a point, we're near Lafayette and we've had a lot of people from Lafayette actually come into our community to try to get vaccinations when they didn't, didn't have in some of those places. But uh, I appreciate your point. You know. Uh-huh. I agree. Being a home bar from the Seventh Ward and Charity Hospital, uh, sometimes you can feel isolated out here in the country. You know. <laughs> no, 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 I, I mean, I I, 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 I appreciate. I go ahead, Corey. I'm sorry. No, no I'm sorry. Uh, I was just saying that, uh, Doctor, uh, Doctor Wells. I mean, you you are a, a pay setter and a church setter for many many years ago, but I know that down there, um, you 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 guys are doing a lot. So I think it would probably be a really good idea to have that shared. Uh, space so that we can know exactly what's going on and then even use some of the things that you are doing in the in the advertising and, and the media spots I mean there's no reason why you shouldn't be on one on, on one of the you know the uh, spots especially the ones that are going to be going uh, down there because you're a trusted face so I think I think that's really important and the numbers coming out of Lafayette Lake Charles the numbers are horrific right now I mean they have been so you know, we, I think it's important, so we'll definitely do that. And, and I thank you so much. I, I learned a lot uh, today. Most importantly, uh, is that they got a black radio station down in, in, in Homer. That, that right there, man, I'm, I'm glad I came. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's one of our board members. There's a lot of good stuff in the country, man. You get outside New Orleans. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. This, this is for uh, Dr. Brown, so we celebrate. Always seems to know the <laughs> Thank you. And the world all right with me. That's all I need. I just yeah, you're a right. little taste. Just a little taste. <laughs>
<laughs> well, thanks. That's all you need. Yeah. Happy day. Thank you, Dr. Riveras. Thank you so you're much welcome. for the work that you're doing and your committee. Um, just some great, great work. All right. Let, let, let me also add my thanks. Oh, um, you are, Dr. Let me add my thanks to the subcommittee and once again to Dr. Riveras for stepping up and taking leadership of the subcommittee. You guys have been doing a great job, and I really enjoyed seeing the videos that y'all are putting out. Keep up the great work. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Dr. Lavis, you're going to have to share a video that you did with us one day uh, when you played your instrument. Oh, well, I'm happy to share. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll have you do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, we have um, the infamous Secretary Kimberly Lewis Robinson, who reminds us that she's not a health disparities expert, but what she does know and she does very well is handle revenue. So she's gonna give us an update about our funding status uh, for the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Secretary Robinson. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown and Dr. Lavie. Um, I can tell you that Dr. Rivera does something else very well and that is spend money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can't take it with you though that's for sure you cannot take it with you that is true right. and out of the total um, budget we had uh, 750,000 allocated out of the governor's COVID funds uh, we have spent $685,425 of those 250,000 was spent on the prevalence study with Oshner. And uh, I think Tracy just shared with everyone another report that was written uh, using the Oshner prevalence study that was funded by the task force to, to talk about other things that are the result of asymptomatic spread. So that was shared with uh, the members just now. And the other things that were funded included the Lamar advertising billboards, the social media campaign, and the commercials that Dr. Rivera just finished sharing with everyone. We also saw the um, health equity dashboard that Dr. Benjamin was sharing earlier. We're going to fund the community engagement process. So that's money that's set aside for that. And I think the vaccine willingness survey will be funded um, going forward. I think that survey will start next week. And that leaves us with approximately $65,000 for a few things that we had talked about projects with LPHI. And I had a conversation with the Baton Rouge Area Foundation two weeks ago about the possibility of coming back for additional funding for future projects of the task force. Um, Dr. Brown and Dr. Levice had conversations with the incoming Biden administration about the National Health Equity Task Force that was created. And I think they, they are following the work that this task force has already done. So I think we have to continue the great work and look for more things to do in the future. So our funders are expecting us to outline things that need to be funded going forward. So while we do have just, just north of $54,000 left in the budget, we have other things to undertake that do not involve Corey Bear smiling into a camera. And I'm only teasing you, Corey, because you, you're unmuted. But um, those are things for us to look at in the future. And we will continue the work that you all have already begun. Maybe some things on that HOMA radio station. Got to ask Sam Jones how often he listens to that, Dr. Wilkes. And it's on our board, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Secretary Robinson. Can you name the three donors uh, so we can publicly acknowledge them and thank them uh, for the so three donors, the UE and Angelina Wilson Foundation, 
the Kennington Foundation and the Baton Rouge Area Foundation are the, are the donors. And Secretary Robinson has uh, been briefing them and informing them and keeping them up to date um, with the uh, work that we are doing and um, the judicious way that we are allocating uh, the funds. So you know, as you can see, a portion of it has gone to the messaging and subcommittees, a portion has gone to research, a portion went to fund Dr. Benjamin's um, uh, webinar today, um, a portion went to study the prevalence study and um, LPHI, you know, so I think we did pretty good in turning a nickel into a dime as best we could. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned about um, the task force uh, getting national recognition for the work that you all are doing. Um, we met myself, Dr. Lavise, Dr. Gee, uh, Dr. Phillips. Uh, met with the President Biden's uh, COVID-19 um, health equity uh, task force. And uh, they had already been informed about the work that we were doing. They had already read our report and um, they applauded the work of the task force. Um, so they were very interested, um, feeling that Louisiana was leading the way. And so, um, I attribute that to you know all the work that you all are doing. Um, at this time, we will move to and any questions for Secretary Robinson. Did you have anything else to add, Secretary Robinson? Um, I think that is everything that we have funded thus far. And I know that we had a few things that were left on the list. Dr. Benjamin and I will be back to this group with an update on the the cost of the community engagement process for the dashboard. And so that will either take the 75,000 that's set aside for it or leave some money available for the economic impact of COVID study that we had talked about with LPHI. So that is what that 64,000 that's remaining is kind of set aside for, is for that research with LPHI. Okay. And so that is, that's the future. And also one of the things that the funders are expecting is to talk about the, the impact from an equity standpoint on the, of, of COVID on different minority communities. Okay. And that brings us right to our next and last topic, which is uh, LPHI, the COVID-19 Community Survey. Um, we have our very own Shalina Davis who uh, is on the task force. As you recall, she co-chaired co the uh, prison subcommittee. Um, Co-leads of this study is uh, Dr. Beth Nauman and Caitlin Canefield. Um, so Ms. Davis. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Phillips um, and the COVID Health Equity Task Force co-chairs and team for allowing us to share with you all today and for a continued partnership um, on ongoing COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. Um, in just a moment, my colleague and staff member, Caitlin Canfield, will share with you a summary of findings from a survey um, that our team um, at LPHI conducted uh, last summer um, to better understand the community's perceptions and needs around COVID-19. Um, I wanna acknowledge our team um, for taking the ownership on this and bringing it forth to our leadership and saying, we really wanna do this, even if we don't have funding for it, um, you know, to really help support uh, longer term efforts around messaging and communication. So just wanna, wanna thank our team there. Uh, lastly, I wanna restate um, what everybody has been saying, you know, we will be working on administering a second survey in partnership with the Department of Health to better understand, understand vaccine hesitancy and other factors um, in the upcoming weeks. So with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Caitlin Canfield. Alrighty, thanks Shalina. Hi everybody. Thank you for having me at this meeting. This is my first time here and it has been really great. So a preface, this is a very high level presentation um, and I will provide a link at the end of the survey where you can find the full survey results on LPHI's website if you are so interested. Alrighty, so what did we do? So in response to COVID-19, LPHI conducted a statewide online survey during June of 2020. Participants were required to be at least 18 years of age and residents of Louisiana, and the survey was offered only in English. 
The final statewide sample totals 1,126 respondents. Our survey sample is majority female and two thirds have some form of education after high school. Over half are between the ages of 18 to 44. Our sample is close to being representative of Louisiana by race with 38% of participants identifying as black and 54% of participants identifying as white. And it is also representative by the public health regions as defined by the Louisiana Department of Health. Next, I'm gonna to shift to showing you results from the survey. Um, and again, it's going to be pretty high level. So just bear that in mind and um, please check out the additional findings um, on our website. So first I'm gonna focus on our findings regarding risk perceptions relating to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So we asked participants the following questions. How concerned are you about the spread of coronavirus? How concerned are you about getting infected with coronavirus and also about dying from coronavirus? So overall, what we found is that more than 80% of Louisianans reported being concerned about getting coronavirus and that 90% reported feeling concerned about coronavirus spreading in their community. We did observe differences by race with more black Louisianans compared to white Louisianans being very concerned about the spread of COVID-19 in their communities. Also more were very concerned about being infected with coronavirus and about dying from the illness. We also observed differences by gender with women reporting higher levels of concern about the spread of COVID-19 in their communities. Also more concerned about getting infected and about dying from COVID-19 compared to their male counterparts. In terms of education, those with a high school degree or less reported feeling more concerned about getting infected and dying from COVID-19 compared to those with higher education. And finally, we did observe regional differences across Louisiana. Concern about the risks of COVID-19 in general is higher in South, at the time of the survey in June 2020 was higher in Southeast Louisiana where the number of cases was greater at the time of the survey compared to other parts of the state. And all differences that I talk about during this survey or during this presentation are statistically significant. Next slide, please. So next I'm gonna talk about our findings regarding the perceived severity of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Thank you. We asked the following question. So we asked, do you think that the health effects of coronavirus are usually worse for people ages 65 or older? And we also asked whether people perceived that the effects were worse for those who already had other health conditions. Finally, we asked whether participants believe that someone who is not showing symptoms can be infected with coronavirus and still spread it to other people. And basically perceived, sever perceived severity of coronavirus is pretty high for each of those questions. On the right hand side of the slide, you'll see the responses to the question, how serious are most cases of coronavirus? The responses most survive, some die, and almost everyone sur survives are probably the most accurate. But it's interesting to see that one quarter of respondents have the perception that many survive, many die. Next slide, please. So next I'd like to talk with you about some of the differences that we observed with regards to these questions. We found that perceived severity of COVID-19 for older adults and those with other health conditions was lower among black Louisianans younger adults, and those with a high school degree or less. However, these same groups, so Black Louisianans, younger adults, and those with a college degree or less, were more likely to perceive that many survive, many die, compared to most survive, one, some die. We found it interesting that, at least for these subgroups, there's an apparent contrast between lower perceived severity of COVID-19 for particular individuals compared to a greater perceived seriousness of the disease in terms of mortality. And accordingly, white Louisianans, older people, and those with higher education perceived greater severity of COVID-19, but less seriousness in terms of the fatality of the disease. Next slide, please. Our next section is going to provide insights into our findings on preventive behaviors um, to combat the spread of COVID-19. Next slide. About a quarter of Louisianans report that they stayed home all the time, except for essential outings, and another 40% reported staying home most of the time. About half of Louisianans report that they practice social distancing all the time, and another third do so most of the time. A little less than half report wearing a mask all the time, 
and another 20% do so most of the time when in public. Looking at the right-hand side of the screen in orange, we asked folks about whether their hand hygiene practices had changed since before the pandemic. 80% of respondents say that they wash or sanitize their hands much more or a little more frequently compared to before they learned about the coronavirus. Next slide, please. So again, I'll give you an overview of the demographic differences that we observed. About half of both white and black Louisianans reported social distancing all the time, but more white Louisianans than black Louisianans reported social distancing most of the time. More black Louisianans than white Louisianans reported wearing a mask all the time in public. And we found it interesting that wearing a mask was higher, but social distancing lower among black Louisianans, which may reflect community norms or structural factors that inhibit social distancing, the ability of people to socially distance. But that black Louisianans use masks more consistently, perhaps to mitigate risk. In terms of age, Louisianans 60 plus were more compliant with all recommended behaviors and 18 to 29 year olds were the least compliant with the exception of mask wearing. More women than men reported staying home all or most of the time and washing hands more frequently. Social distancing and hand hygiene were lowest for those who did not graduate high school, but similar across all other levels of education. And in terms of regional differences, we only saw social distancing varying by region, but not the other prevented behaviors. All right, next we're gonna shift into vaccine willingness, the topic that everyone has been chatting about during this meeting. So we did ask questions about participants' willingness to take the COVID-19 vaccine. And it's important to note that when the survey was fielded in June, 2020, just a reminder, vaccines were not yet available to the public and had not been approved by the FDA. It was a very different moment. Next slide, please. So we asked participants the following question. If a vaccine for coronavirus became available, would you want to get it? Over half of Louisianans said definitely or probably. So in terms of demographic differences, we found that white Louisianans were more likely than black Louisianans to state they would get the vaccine. And we also found that vaccine willingness increases with age. Men reported being more willing to get the vaccine than women. And people with health insurance coverage were more likely to say that they would definitely or probably get vaccinated compared to those without insurance, which is likely related to their perceived ability to access the vaccine affordably. Willingness to get the vaccine increases by level of education. And we did observe some regional differences. So we saw vaccine acceptability being highest in Southeast Louisiana, specifically um, LDH public health regions one, two, three, and nine. Next slide, please. Briefly, I'm gonna to touch on participants' responses regarding sources of information for COVID-19. Next slide. So we asked folks how much they trust the five sources of information listed on this slide, how much they trust them for information about COVID-19. And the most trusted source of information reported was local officials with more than half of respondents reporting a lot of trust and another 30% reporting some trust. The next most trusted source of information is state government and health department, followed by health professionals, employers, and church or faith leaders. Finally, next slide please, I am going to share with you a high level overview of our findings regarding mental health. Next slide please. So we asked participants in the past week, how often have you felt depressed, anxious, and also how often have you felt lonely? And we observed differences by age, race, and gender. Younger Louisianans were much more likely than those over the age of 45 to report feeling anxious, depressed, or lonely in the past week. Black Louisianans reported feeling lone, were more likely to report feeling lonely than white Louisianans. And more females than males felt anxious, depressed, and lonely in terms of self-report. One question that we did ask was around household income um, since the pandemic began on March 1st, 2020. One third of our survey participants reported a decrease in household income. And among those who experienced a decrease in income, they were far more likely to report feeling anxious and depressed compared to those individuals who did not experience a decrease in income since March 1st. 
Like I said, next slide, please. This is a very high level overview. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the LPHI's COVID survey work group. Funding um, was also contributed by Louisiana Campaign for Tobacco-Free Living, or TFL, and the survey was administered by um, MDRG, which is an online polling company. Um, next slide, please. You all are more than welcome to find our full survey results at www.lphi.org forward slash COVID-19. And for any media inquiries, you're more than welcome to contact Brittany Fowler at the email address provided. Finally, we have one last slide around next steps. So we are currently working in partnership with LDH to field a second COVID-19 survey, which will have an expanded focus on, COVID, on vaccine willingness. Um, we do plan to field data collection in January, which is right now, and early February. So um, stay tuned and results will be disseminated via LPHI's website. And we also plan to present to the public um, if there is interest. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Canfield. Do we have uh, any questions? So did I hear correctly that this is a survey that you, can you, you plan to continue to do this and monitor uh, trends? Correct. Um, we will not sample the exact same people, but we'll use the same methodology for the subsequent survey so that we can hopefully do some comparisons over time. Right. Okay. I had a question about the, uh, a lot of that information was, was uh, you know, kind of what we would expect in terms of behavior and, and, and responses. You would expect someone who lost income uh, to have more stress and, and more worry. Uh, but I was surprised at the, the, the disparate number of folks who relied more on local officials than they would on uh, state government or even health officials. Is there any uh, anecdotal information about those responses? Yeah, we we don't have much more anecdotal and that is, that is a, we only asked one question about sources of information. And so that is going to be a larger focus on the subsequent survey as well is expanding some of the definitions that were used expanding the sources so that we can get more granular um, and with the uh, with an eye towards informing media and communications campaign. So I don't have much more, but to say that there should be more information very soon. I, I can I can give you an anecdote. We involved the local mayors in St. Mary Parish and particularly uh, two of our uh, uh, cities, uh, African-American mayors, and uh, they were extremely, they're very well trusted. Uh, in, in addition to being related to half the people in the communities they serve. So, uh, and I can tell you as a healthcare provider, you know, uh, we did the same thing. You know, the first one to take the shot publicized it. Um, and it, 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 that is a very trusted source in local communities. I had the pleasure of being on the parish council as well as being, uh, you know, a physician. And uh, that, that goes a long, long way <laughs> in these small communities, I can tell you. Oh, I, and I, I, I get what we call the Jamaica effect, right? Everybody does every job, everything that's needed to be done oh, yeah. and trust each other. And, and that's fine. The, the problem that I would have is when the information is incorrect from those local officials. Mm -hmm. um, if it's good information. If it's trust, trusted information, that's fine. But you see folks saying, well, I don't know, and I don't care what the federal government says, I don't care what the state says, but in my parish or my town, this is what, I'm the law, and this is what I'm going to do. And it's total, totally uh, 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 fact, uh, not based on fact and based on, you know, their, their feelings. That's the part that, that gives me pause. Well, I can tell you it was, it was fact in our community, you know, but it goes back to what I said in the very beginning. You have to have a national strategy, just like the scene from uh, President Biden, where he's mandating mask wearing in all federal locate buildings, the governor comes behind him and says, "I'm gonna mandate the same thing on a state level." Yeah. Then the local mayors, if they're given the authority, authority can do the same thing, yeah. and the parish representatives. That's what it's gonna take us for us to achieve that that ripple effect that I think we're all looking yeah. for. It's yeah. it's same to me like civil rights. You know, you can pass federal legislation, but if you don't enact it at the local level, then it's not going to be effective. So, um, but the, the folks I'm referencing anecdotally, like she was asking for, I know for a fact, uh, the mayors I'm talking about, they're our patients, 
their faith leaders. The, so they have a lot of trust that has been earned historically. But I'm, I'm aware of what you're saying, and that that's true for certain communities. And yeah. uh, it's a bridge we have to cross. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about the younger group um, having um, anxiety or mm -hmm. depression, is that the uh, less than 45 year old age group? It's the 18 to 29 year olds. Um, and we have a couple of different thoughts on that. Um, one could be, I mean, the questions that we asked were not clinical, um, you know, assessments. And so we're really relying on self-report. So there may be, I think that mental health stigma could be playing a role here with younger individuals being more willing or aware of um, mental health challenges that they might be facing um, compared to older adults. Um, so there could be something there. There could also be something we were, we were surprised initially that we didn't see higher levels of loneliness among older adults. Um, they actually had like not much, they didn't have much self-reported loneliness. And I think that part of what we talked about is that young people spend so much of their lives. So like adolescents are within that 18 to 29 year old group, right? So they spend so much of their lives socializing, like their entire life and world is built on, on social relationships, um, and their networks. And so I think that the lockdowns um, and coronavirus restrictions may kind of have changed their day-to-day -day lives even more than older adults. Well, I'll tell you Perhaps. one thing that may be affecting also, there are very, very progressive council on agings in, uh, in these rural communities. Mm. Uh, there's some parishes that actually have millages dedicated to uh, mm -hmm. taking care of uh, their council on agings. They do a tremendous outreach yeah. and stay in touch with these folks uh, delivering meals as well as socialization programs. So yeah. I don't know if that's a sub fact. And Dr. Brown, Dr. Levis, I don't know if you all are interested, but there are lots of other entities that are also doing surveys. Lucille is doing one. Uh, Centene did one with the the, the uh, testing that we did a few months ago, uh, getting a lot of this same sort of data. So I don't know if the committee as a whole would be interested in some of that data. Some of it is overlapping what you reported. Uh, they, some of them did it a little bit later than what you all did it, and they're continuously doing them. So I think it'd be good to have a repository for mm -hmm. all the different entities that are collecting that data for the, the committee to look at. Yeah, we're going to take a look at that and, and, and see you know, what we wanted to do, either bring it here to the committee or maybe somewhere on a website, on our website, we can kind of report these surveys. Is this available at the, the LPHI website? Yes, uh, it is. Yeah, uh, so maybe we could, you know, embed it, embed it into our website as well, so people can get it there and link off of it to their website. Yeah. Also, to Janine Tate, because we're up. That's the repository to upload uh, our information on our COVID nineteen website. Shalina, can can you send that? To, yes, uh, I will send it to Janine. Yep. I have a question. So um, when you do this analysis by demographics, I noticed that you don't separate the information in groups. For example, you have 54% per of non-Hispanic whites. So it will be great to separate the data from the whites by age, because you have a high percentage of young people so uh, this, this data that you show us is like a general overview, but doesn't allow us to really go to the focus in what we need. So uh, what the white Americans uh, younger think about mental health, about vaccinations, et cetera. So crossing the data in the demographic groups to get more punctual or focus in results. Right, so yeah, for today, we focus primarily on more high level findings. Um, we do have more detailed or granular analyses available on the website. And then of course, for any manuscripts that we're working on, we'll be you know, performing more multivariate analyses to kind of detect, to be more precise. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you okay, so much thank you. for sharing your results. Uh, we'll move to public comments. Dr. Katera Williams, are, are there any public comments? There are no public comments at this time.
All right, thank you. Um, well, we've had a full agenda. We thank our presenters uh, who provided our task force uh, with this update. We thank our task force for the meaningful work that you're doing. Um, we can't get fatigued from COVID until COVID is fatigued. Uh, so the task force will be actively engaging with LDH and the uh, vaccine rollout campaign. And in the words of the Dr. Corey Abair, wash up, mask up, separate, and vaccinate. Dr. Lavise. Well, I don't know if I want to try to uh, follow behind. <laughs> behind that, all I all, all I'll say is that we we you know we we're going to start meeting on a more regular cadence now that we're into the vaccine phase. So um, you know, Dr. Brown and I, uh, on our weekly meeting, we'll we'll start uh, putting together. Uh, a pattern of meetings, either every other week or twice a month or some pattern like that as, until we get through the, get further into the vaccine distribution portion of this, of this issue. So thank you all. Everyone have a wonderful weekend and stay safe. And I just remind everyone to say a prayer tonight for the great American icon we lost today, Hank Aaron, passed away, if you didn't hear that. Yes. Keep them in your prayers. Yeah. Hammer. Yeah, All right, Dr. Rivera, you going to take us out with anything? Yeah, I could take you out. I always can. I always can. Y'all have a good weekend. Everybody be safe. Let's do a little party. <laughs> we waiting. Come on, Steve. <laughs> I used to dream of being rich. Had a lot of houses and cars, but no one's going to stay.